emotionally and spiritually and and even when we're trapped in our own mind and we think this is all this is all that there is there's another place God wants to take you you see we've been talking about being in one accord when Pentecost came we were in one accord and I've seen that happening here in treasure I've seen it happening in the kingdom of heaven I've seen it happening all across on mission ministries how things are dropping off that are not of the Lord that are of man so that we can become pure in one accord in Jesus name and I, I see it dropping off of us corporately and individually in Jesus name and the main thing that's dropping off of us is this unforgiveness hatred our way our selfishness in favor of love you know why it's hard to love because we've never been loved yeah I, I can't mandate love I can't tell you how to love I, I can't I, we can say Jesus told us to love but he did more than tell us he showed us didn't he he showed us what unconditional love was, looks like he showed us how to leave the pain what if he was c carrying this around all the time Man, I can't believe those guys let Barabbas go. Still mad at them because they let Barabbas go instead of me. What if he was stuck on that, right? Well, he didn't do it. Well, some of y'all are still mad that they let Barabbas go. We don't have to be that way anymore. Then we talked about the weapons that we have. Sometimes we feel powerless, but the Bible says that we have weapons that are powerful to demolish strongholds. I'm going to talk about the elephant today. Some of y'all been walking around this elephant. This elephant has been very smelly in your living room. Not only do you pretend like you ain't there, you pretend like you don't smell him, like nobody else notices him. What elephant? I don't know what you're talking about. Would you like to slice him up, dice him, and feed him to the devil right now today in Jesus' name? That's what God wants you to do today because you have the power and the weapons to destroy the strongholds. You got a trouble in your relationship at home with your spouse and and you just walk around each of you just tiptoeing around okay I don't want to I don't want to poke the elephant today S slice him up love him up let God change him forever in Jesus name not just once not every day have to deal with this over and over freedom man I heard some freedom stories already about the women's thing how about that that isn't about a women's thing. That is about God's revolution in all of us in Jesus' name. And we need it. Just like Brother Stan preached the other day, boil down to two things. Tithe, that's a very important thing. You know, you wonder why you're not having uh, blessings in your life? Well, you're, we're walking out of obedience. We're not in obedience, okay? We want all these things. We want God to answer all of our prayer requests, but some things are conditional. One of them is tithing. If you do this, then I'll do that. So let's do it together in Jesus' name. The second thing he said was this. We need the Holy Spirit. Amen. We've been trying to live from our mind. I talk about it a lot. We've been trying to, to, to train our minds to think the proper things when somebody's at the grocery store and they're using all those coupons in front of you. And it takes 45 minutes. By the way, I'm going to start getting into that too because I need to save some money. So... So we just think, I'm going to train my mind, but what if your whole spirit had just taken over and you love them and you say, hey, could you teach me how to be a couponer because you're awesome? Could you, could you, could you, could you know, could I pray for you right now? Could we stand together? Could I take you out to lunch, you know? And just completely change our attitude over whatever it might be that is kind of irritating us on that day. And I thank the Lord for people that know how to save money because I need to learn how to do it myself then the thing we talked about last week while we were in california was little preston came in and started talking about the fire didn't he he wasn't just talking about the fire he was living in the fire you saw a demonstration of the fire and how it took his life over in jesus name how he had a choice to live from the from the ashes of yesterday and the relationship that he's had with his dad and all of those painful things or the fire of the holy ghost and he let that happen in jesus name he walked intentionally into it. So all of these have been building us to this place of talking about the revolution. If you, if you missed any of those steps along the way, let's catch up right now. Let's just invite them right now. Let's, let me, let's just pray. I'm going to lead us in prayer. Lord God, in Jesus' name, if there's any place inside of us where we're not in one accord, in our family, if there's unforgiveness in our families, or in anywhere along the way, or over pastors, or over anybody else that's offended us, we know that offense comes from the devil. Right now, in Jesus' name, we ask for forgiveness for holding offense. And we release people over that in Jesus' name because we want to be in one accord with you, Lord God, in Jesus' name. And Lord God, 
we thank you for showing us through your son Jesus what real love looks like. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Today you'll be with me in paradise. It is finished, Jesus said, from the cross, all these things and more. And he said, greater love hath no man than he would lay down his life for his friend. And Lord, that's what we're going to do. That's how we're going to love today in Jesus' name. Father, you didn't leave us powerless in this world. You sent us the Holy Ghost. And then you said, I've given you weapons for destroying the strongholds. Father, it's time for us to use them. And Lord God, many of us have been in the fire before. But we ran away because it got a little too hot. And we were satisfied with the portion of Jesus and the portion of religion and the powerlessness of our life. But Lord God, let us stay in the fire to be refined to the place where we have the tongue of fire. And nothing will stand against us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today I've time to talk to you about a battle. It is a battle that can be won. It's a battle against about the Israelites. By the way, that's us. A reflection of us. It's about their battle after Egypt, after the Red Sea, after they had even crossed into the Promised Land and across the Jordan, after the 40 years of wandering, and it's the first era of the judges. It's before King Saul and King David and Solomon and the following. So that chronologically puts you in the place of where the battle is. Now the battle was against the Midianites, the Israelites versus the Midianites. I did not say the cowboys against the Redskins. Although I think that the Redskins probably have some Midianite in their bloodline, myself. Midian was one of Abraham's sons also. So Isaac was the son that led to the children of Israel. Ishmael was the son that eventually led to Muhammad and Islam. And Midian was another son by another wife. And this led to the Midianites there. The Midianites were many. They were innumerable. They couldn't count their camels, the Bible says. They were so many of them that they couldn't count their, their camels. Now, we're going we're gonna to see what the Israelis' re response to this, what the Israelites' response to this is, because it might be our response too. But we, today we can do something different. They were bullies. They were as thick as locusts. Sometimes in your life, in the battle that we face, we think there's no way out. We think that there's such a cloud around us that we can't see our way out. We think, hey, man, I can't even count their camels over there. I'll never win this battle. That's not what God says. So we have a chance to move in this way. So let me tell you what this battle is against. Is it a battle of the flesh? No, it's not a battle of the flesh. It's a battle versus our own flesh and our own fears. Is the battle moving us from the fear into the faith, beyond the flesh and into the faith. It's a battle of dreams and hopes and God's promises. Would you like some of that? To dream and to hope and to have a promise of God versus bondage and fear and isolation. Great strategies of the devil. First of all, I find over and over again that he tries to scare us with unreality, with things that are not even real, not going to happen. The second thing that he uses a lot is rejection. He uses rejection because rejection is all about yesterday. Not only are these things, not only are these things, these, this fear and rejection, which are tr true, big, huge strongholds, not only are they emotions, but beyond that, there are spirits. There are demon spirits of fear, demon spirits of rejection. It's very real, but they can be des delivered and destroyed today in Jesus' name. It's a battle of separation and self-interest or soaring on wings as eagles. You see, if we're self-interested and we're separated, guess what? We're looking right down here. But if we're soaring on wings as eagles, we have a whole different perspective. We have God's perspective. It's a battle to break our father's sins and shortcomings and replace with victory and faith. It's a battle to overcome yesterday's defeats with God's promises. We, all of us, can break out of the lies and the bondages of yesterday and live free from this moment on. God wants to show us how to win this battle every day through Gideon. You see, Gideon was a regular guy. I've been out there sometimes cutting grass with y'all, and believe me, y'all are regular guys too. Y'all get to sweating just like everybody else. Been walking a mile or two with some different friends. Gideon was a regular guy, a small town guy with an average family history. Would you join the journey today, and would you pray? Now, that's the precursor to this message, and I'm going to talk about the message in a second, but I want to stop right here and let you know just a little bit about California. Lane, have you got a video for us? Lane's got a video, he's gonna roll this video. Y'all watch this video, and then I've asked uh, my dear brother Ray uh, to share just a word about the battle that we saw raging and how God is winning that. Welcome Nadine, welcome Dustin, glad y'all are here.
Fire it off, Lane. Thank you, brother. Everybody asked me about my beautiful beard. When I was in California, when I wanted to where they were at, I wanted to try to look like them. I didn't want to go in all dressed up, real fancy shoes, real fancy clothes and stuff. It's hard to stand and talk to somebody that's homeless and poor when you're standing there all dressed up. It's kind of like spitting in their face to me, so I tried to act and do like they did. And I want to tell you what happened to me in California. It was beautiful. We re every morning we had an upper room experience from about 10 to about 11, 11.30 or whatever. Whenever the Holy Spirit said it ended, that's when it was ended. And then we would go out and spend all day pulling across, talking to people. About the 
third day before we come home, Jeremy was with us from the Freedom, Denton Freedom House, and he was in the bed. It was Austin sitting here, Andrew sitting here. Not Andrew, yeah. He was sitting here, and uh, Nesto, Nesto was sitting next to us. And that, Jeremy was on his knees, and he was praying for each person, for a specific reason for each person. I had been wanting to be broke on this trip because I knew I had some stuff in me that that I, had, I needed to get out. Alan had done a deliverance with me a little while ago, but almost some of the deliverances don't catch everything. So I was sitting there on my knees, and I was praying, and I reached over and touched Austin's leg and his back, and I broke out in tears. I just started crying. I could not quit crying. I could not quit crying. And the Holy Spirit would just keep bringing stuff up that I've done. The people I've hurt, the hurt I put on my family, the hurt I put on other people, the hurt I put on everybody. And it just wouldn't quit, and it just kept coming, and it just kept coming. Well, I, I got up and went in the bathroom, was sitting in the bathroom crying because I didn't want to disturb what they were doing out there. And I sat in there for about 15 minutes and cried in the bathroom, and I, I, I decided I needed to get up and go outside. And I went out and laid up on the van, and I was crying on the van because it just wouldn't quit because the Holy Spirit just kept pouring into me the stuff that I had done. And out there on that van, I repented. And I asked the Lord to forgive me for all the hurt that I've caused all everybody. When I was a little bit younger, a little bit wilder, I hurt a lot of people. I did a lot of stuff that should have never been done. Should have been in jail for it. Thank God I wasn't. But the Lord has forgiven me for it. The way you get closer to the Lord is to let him pour into you. Amen. Let him crucify this flesh. And then you can have more of him and less of me. That's what I wanted. And that's what the Lord did to me out there. And it was such an honor and a blessing to go outside and cry and seek the Lord and be broke. Because I prayed and I asked for a brokenness on this trip. And I got what I asked for. And I want to thank Alan and Gary Don and all the guys that I went out there with. They took care of me. They helped me. They stayed with me. I'm 70 years old trying to keep up with a bunch of young bucks and them pulling them crosses. Yeah, buddy. You got to pick it up. But we're not a quitter. And, and I, I'm going to tell you one other thing, and I'll quit because Alan, he wants the time. Well, we got, Alan didn't tell nobody we were going to the beach and we're riding all over the place out there trying to find him. I thought we were going to another place. And I kept, I told Gary Don, I said, well, let's don't say we're going, let's, let's don't say we're, we're going to uh, Red, uh, Chico. We are going to Chico, wasn't it? Chico. And he didn't say anything because he knew. He just kind of laughed a little bit. So we finally found the beach. No, I'm not going to, Alan. We finally found the beach. And, <laughs> and uh, so me and Nesto took off, and we went across the two-lane highway, a boulevard, two-lane highway, up a hill, down a hill, over another hill, and finally found the beach, and it's beautiful. And I said, oh, man, look at this. All right. So when we start going back, I go up the hill, down the hill, and I get on my knees and I crawl up that other hill because I couldn't walk up because you think about that far in the sand, you can't hardly walk. So I get up and I go over and I tell them, I said, guys, I don't think I'm going to go back over with you. I'm just going to hang out over here because I didn't think they were going to be there very long. And I thought, well, you know what, I'm not a quitter. I'm not, I'll go back again. So I went back over to the beach. We had a good time on the beach. And when we come back, Austin got on one side of me. And Nesto got on the other side and they helped me up the first hill. I made it good down the second hill. But going back up that other hill... I said, y'all just let me go. I'll crawl. I did it a while ago. I can do it again. So I crawled up the hill, and uh, we made it over to the van. But this is a trip I'll never forget. All the pictures you've seen up here, they're real. They're real. We seen people when we were in San Francisco. We, we went by a place, and there was a guy that was so messed up on drugs, he was crawling on his hands and knees. He looked like a dog out there, actually. And, and I, it broke my heart to see all that. And this is the last thing. I kept telling Alan and Gary Don, I said, this is just driving me crazy. It hurts me so bad to see these people live like this and, and just to reject us and not, not have anything to do with us. And then God scolded me one morning, and he said, it's not about you. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me, and I'll talk to them at the end time. And after he told me that, I apologized to the Lord and asked for forgiveness for it, and I never asked nothing else about what those people were doing. Well, they rejected us not because they did not reject me. They rejected my Lord and Savior. Thank y'all. What we're talking about today, Ray, is a is a fellow named Gideon. He was a regular fellow like me and you. But he didn't have any quit in him either. No, I, no. 
You don't have any quit in you. No, I don't quit. I think the Lord has taught us something. Because, see, the flesh will make you want to just stay by the van instead of get back over to the ocean with your friends, won't he? But the flesh can't have you, can't it, Ray? <laughs> he had you long enough, right? That what you, what you did and what you've told us right there is a model yeah. of our life. It's the same thing you were talking about up there a while ago. You've got to give it up. I mean, you've you got, you got to. Lord, in Jesus' name, we thank you for Ray's willingness to stay in the wine press until the blood of Jesus comes out of him. We thank you for his willingness to go the extra mile, Lord God, even when the cramps were all over him. There wasn't any quit, wasn't any whining. and he's just keeping on going in Jesus' name. We thank you that he's not searching for the American dream anymore, Lord God, but that he's fully in with two feet for you in the revolution, Lord God. That you're moving all of us, Lord God, to, to have that kind of a temperament for battle and to claim the victory today and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Ray. Give that guy a hand right there. Jesus' name. Now, y'all don't seem to have a lot of energy today. What's up with that? Is it, have y'all been watching cartoons a lot? Is that what it is? Been, that's, Gary, that's what they've been doing. They've been sleeping late till about 9.30 what, and then watching the Flintstones. Is that what y'all been doing? I think, Tina, I know that's what you've been doing. doing that. Yeah, you have been. You've been doing that. Well, okay, this is called a Bible, all right? This screen is not a Bible. This is a Bible. Hold, yeah. your, hand, hold your Bible up if you got one. All right, that's a pretty good start. That's a little better. Oh now, oh, now they're coming. Okay. Let's use them today. How about that? We're going to look at the book of Judges, chapter 6, right here in Jesus' name. I don't care if you have an electronic Bible, but the old leather, the old leather does pretty good. Judges, chapter 6. As I mentioned before, the children of Israel, in the book of Genesis, we see that the, the earth was destroyed, and then here comes Abraham and the children of Israel, and then here comes Exodus, and they break out, and they leave the bondage of Egypt, and then they, they're coming into the promised land after 40 years of wandering, and then just beyond that is the place of the judges. And Gideon is one of the first judges, not the first one, but uh, in the succession. But it wasn't about his judgeship that I want to talk about today. It's about his humanity. Hi, Susan. Golly, Susan Young, back from the Cross for the Nations. All right. That's what I'm talking about. All right. So we're gonna, I'm just going to kind of set the, I'm going to set the battlefield, okay? Uh, you know, you want to know where, who you're fighting against and what the battle looks like? Well, you want to know who your enemy is? So just kind of setting up the battlefield so you can see what, what we're going into together right now in Jesus' name. So Judges chapter 6. I'm going to just skip through some scriptures here. You can read the whole story later in 6, 7, and 8. That'll come together for you. But I'm just going to uh, abbreviate this so we can get to the points God wants me to talk specifically about today in Jesus' name. Father, I ask for a blood covering in everything that we talk about today in Jesus' name. The end of verse uh, chapter 5, it says, And the land was at rest for 40 years. See, isn't that ultimately the goal? For our land, for our heart, to, for our person to be at rest. Isn't that an awesome place? Not worried about anything, not strangled by anything. That is where we need to go. Well, what's the devil's job? It is to make us restless and to add whatever he wants to do to our life to make us restless. Chapter 6, verse 1. Then the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, before we chunk a rock at them, let's just look in the, in the mirror just a little bit. Oh, and Johnson did evil in the sight of the Lord. There I am right there. Then the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian for seven years. So you do evil, what happens? Boom, you're trapped by the devil. Don't, don't do evil and then just think, oh, I'll just say a little prayer and I'll get out of the evil. There is a consequence for our evil. Some of you have learned from that, though. <laughs> the rest of us will if we haven't yet. Verse 2. The powerful hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because, the Midian, because of Midian, the sons of Israel made for themselves dens and hideouts which were in the mountains and caves and, and mountain strongholds. The reason I wanted to talk about this part of it is because that's what the devil wants us to do. He wants to separate us into a cave. Are we part of the revolution if we're in a cave over there? If we've withdrawn ourselves, if we don't have any friends to hang out with, to team up with, we're not part of the revolution. Verse 6. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. Well, here's something right. 
How many of you would like to cry out today? Help us, Lord Jesus. Help us, Father. Help us, Yahweh. I need you. If you're not raising your hand asking for help now, guess what? You're not going to get it. Verse 16. The Lord answered him, I will certainly be with you, and I will strike down the Midianites. Now, sometimes we want this answer from the Lord to come five minutes after our sin. But sometimes it comes five months. Sometimes it comes five years. Sometimes it fi comes five decades. But it's coming. Keep crying. Jesus said, keep knocking, didn't he? Keep knocking. Verse 16. The Lord answered, I will certainly be with you, and I will strike down the Midianites. Guys, he is with us to strike down the Midianites in Jesus' name. Verse 21. And the angel of the Lord put out the end of his staff. So Gideon has a meeting with this angel, okay? And this is the consecration of it. This is how it's terminated. This is how it's finished. This is how he makes a decision, and he knows that the angel of the Lord is with him, that God is with him, and he's not going back. So, so when we get into this place of consecration, this is a victory. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand, and he touched the meat and unleavened bread, and the fire flared up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread, and the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Gideon realized without any doubt he was the angel of the Lord, and he declared, I've seen the angel face to face. Now, when we get, our, get to a place, we know we've sinned, we ask God to forgive us our sin, we hear God say that I'm with you. How many of you have gone through those three things? I've sinned. I need your help, Lord. I know you're with us, right? Those three things, okay? Maybe you've gone through some illness in your life. Maybe you've seen some places in your life that you haven't been faithful. Now you come to the place of consecration, Terry Jackson, where you say, even though I've come through this thing, I'm consecrated. I'm not looking to the right or to the left. I know who I am, and my God is going to deliver me. And I consecrate myself right there. That means I've set my face, and I'm not going backwards. That's what happens. So that's the precursor to where we're going into this battle. Judges chapter 6, verse 25 through 27. Do you want something new, treasure? Do you want something new? That's my question. Do you want something new? In order to have something new, guess what? You've got to let go of the old. Yeah, you, are, you, are you always heard that story about that boy with the, with the, 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 the really liked Oreos. Now, I don't know anybody like that myself. And his mama said, don't, don't get any Oreos now. But sure enough, when mama wasn't looking, he... Don't put his hand out in the cookie jar, right? Well, about that time she comes in, and there he is. Acting like y'all, when I'll come up on y'all, and y'all do something y'all shouldn't be doing. Happens all the time, by the way. Get your hand out of the cookie jar. Well, Mama, I can't get my hand out of the cookie jar. It's stuck. What do you mean it's stuck? It's stuck, I can't get it out. I told you not to put it in the first place, blah, 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 blah. It's stuck, I can't get it out. Well, I guess we're going to have to break the cookie jar. About the time she gets that hammer, raises it up, all of a sudden, he lets go of the Oreo, and his hand comes on out of there. That's how come our hand's stuck. That's how come we're stuck. Tracy won't let go of the Oreo. We want something new. We want to get free, but we got the Oreo right there. Okay, moving on. Judges 6, 25 through 27. Now, on that same night, the Lord said to Gideon, Take your father's bull the second bull, seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that belongs to your father and cut down the Asherah pole that's beside it. Now, Baal was a false god that people regularly worship back here, and Asherah was a goddess of fertility that people also worshipped. They had temples of Baal and Asherah poles. And so we see this over and over in generations. So there's a good king, and he does everything right, and he bows down to Yahweh, and, and he loves the Lord, and the, and the land, land prospers. And then you have a selfish king that comes in, and all of a sudden what he does is he, he erects a temple to Baal. Really what he's doing is erecting a temple to himself in his own image, right? And here comes the Asherah pole. And now that can represent our fathers. Everybody look at me. That can represent our fathers, our generations past the loveless acts that they may have done over us, the curses that they may have brought down, that they may not have even decided upon, the hurt that they physically imparted to us, the abuse and the mental abuse or the neglect, and all of these things are the bales and the Asherah poles that have come from generations. Or maybe your, your dad and mom were awesome, but your grandparents were this way. And so these spirits, the spirit of, of this pain is now wanting to get a hold of us. Well, these are our Asherah poles and our bales in our life. And God has told Gideon, go and get rid of them. 
You need to get rid of the things that your father has put on you. The curses that have come from other generations, not necessarily our physical fathers, but from other generations all the way back in America to slavery. That we're still seeing that right here in America. We will break that off in Jesus' name. We're going to do everything to love through that and to break all of those things off. Everything that separates us from the love of God and the love of the man beside us. In Jesus' name. we got to tear them down. So this is what's happening with Gideon right here. God's telling them to tear them down. So he's commanded them to tear it down. And then he says, verse 26, and build an altar to the Lord. See, he didn't say just tear this down. He said, and build an altar to the Lord. Tear down the things of evil from your grandparents and your, and your parents and your forefathers in America and all the way back to Adam. It doesn't just stop in America. All the way back to Adam and build an altar to the old Lord. Well, that altar, sometimes when you read in the Old Testament, you think, well, he just wants me to get some rocks. Well, I got some rocks. I'll go down to the nursery and give me some rocks. No, he's talking about building an altar in your heart. Amen. Where you sacrifice yourself on that altar and he is on the altar of your heart. And you're not on the altar of your heart anymore. In Jesus' name, the old things are passed away in the new altar of the Lord God. See, when we build something, that means we put an effort. Somebody say effort into it. I don't know how many of y'all picked up a hammer lately, but it takes some effort to do it, especially when you're an old man like me. So when you build an altar, you're putting some effort into this. This is my God. I'm following him. And this is, this is how I'm going to build this thing. And build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the mountain of Mountain of stronghold with stones laid down in an orderly way. So who, what's the first, if you're going to build an altar and you're going to use some stones, what's the first stone of your altar? What's his name? Jesus, that's right, the cornerstone. With the stones laid down in an orderly way following Jesus. Then take the second bull offered in the burnt offering and the wood of the Asherah. Cut down, check this out. So he told them to cut down the Asherah, tear down the temple, and it was just a big pile of wood. And he said, use that as the wood to burn up the offering. See, that is completely demolishing it. He didn't say, I want you to repurpose this wood in your house. It's going to look good in your under your cabinets. Tear it down, burn it down, get it out of your life, get it off your cell phone, get it out of your heart, get it, get it gone at Christmas and the family reunions. That's not who you are anymore. Don't let the elephant hang around in your den anymore in Jesus' name. Verse 27, then Gideon took ten men, servants, and did just as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his father's household and his relatives, the men of the city, he did it during the night. He didn't do it during the day. And are you mad at him because he did it at night? No. He figured out a way to get it done. Amen? Amen. You're going to figure out a way to get it done. The first thing you want to do in this way, if you want to win this kind of a battle, if you want to separate the Midianites and put up underneath their feet right now, is you have got to tear down hell. The hell history has got to go in your life. Tear them down, burn them up in Jesus' name. The second thing is this. You have to cross over in order to conquer. Judges chapter 6, verses 33 and 34. You have to cross over in order to conquer. You have to tear down the stronghold. You have to tear down the hell in your life. Then you have to cross over to conquer. Chapter 6, verse 33 and 34. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites. See, those Midianites, they had some friends. That's how hell does it, right? Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east assembled together and they crossed over the Jordan and they camped in the valley of Jezreel. So the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon and empowered him and he blew a trumpet. I have a little note here. It says, don't go into battle naked. So the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon and empowered him and he blew a trumpet. You know, our first reaction when something happens to us is not to clothe ourselves in the spirit of the Lord, but to clothe ourselves with some crack or clothe ourselves uh, with, a, with some aspirin or clothe ourselves with a doctor or clothe ourselves with a friend that will empathize. I'm just going to call them because they feel sorry for me and I feel sorry for them. And we'll just, we'll just, we'll just go down in this pit together. See, our reaction should be clothe myself in the spirit right now, dude. Okay, because the, the flesh thing's still going to happen, but, you know, we become so Americanized and, and, and expect to live a life of such comfort. All right, just take a pill for this or take a friend for that. That's not how God wants us to do. He wants us to clothe ourselves in his spirit and blow the trumpet. See, that's an important part of this thing. He did not blow the trumpet uh, of, oh, woe is me. He blew the trumpet of victory right here in Jesus' name. Chapter 7, verse 1. Then Jerubbabel, that's also Gideon's, that's Gideon's given name. 
Then Jerubbabel. I kind of like saying it, Jerubbabel. Can y'all do it? Jerubbabel. Next time your kids are messing up, go, hey, Jerubbabel, get over here. Give them another name. Hey, Jerubbabel. I like that. Kind of got to go like this, though. Then Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him got up early. Uh-oh, 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 they got up early. All y'all that come into worship at 1020, I don't know if this is for y'all or not. All the people, somebody say all the people. In White Oak. Now, now y'all started to drop off when I said that in White Oak thing. Are going to get up early and worship. How about that? He's calling you to it, okay? Then Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him got up early and camped. Somebody say, camp beside the spring. Well, we know we need to be clothed in the Spirit. There's the Holy Ghost right there. And now we need to know that we need to be camped by the spring. So when I was reading this, uh, first I just cruised right by it, but then the Lord said, back up, son. Your people and you need to be camped by the spring. You see, the spring is the Holy Spirit. The spring is not the Dead Sea. It's not a lake. It's not a reservoir. It is a spring, which means it's eternal water. It's coming all the time with constant refreshing of mercy and grace and love and poise and joy and hope and always being refreshed. <laughs> I probably shouldn't tell you all this, but because I'm a transparent guy, I will. And I'll tell you, Kathy. So somehow or long... <laughs> Especially because some of my friends that have really good hygiene may be here today, so I probably shouldn't tell you this. Well, somehow or the other, I've been taking care of my mom at the hospital for the last four or five days and been spending the night, three, three or four days, spending the night over there, and I, I just didn't seem to be able to make it in the shower for a few days, you know. But when I did, David, it was like a spring, okay? Believe me, I did not want to get out of there. I did not want to get out of there. Thank you, Royce. I'm too transparent sometimes, Crenshaw. I'm sorry about that. We, 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 need to be, we need to have that spring going on in us all the time, okay? We need to have that spring of refreshing in us all the time. So I want us to stay in that place. I'm going to finish this verse. verse chapter 7, verse 1. Then Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him got up early and camped, did not leave the spring. They camped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Moriah. In order for us to get this victory we have to cross over in order to conquer what we do sometimes most of the time is we walk around the elephant we cope with the elephant we have coping mechanisms we have people in our family instead of confronting them in love and saying let's do something different about this and then releasing it you see here's what happens we have somebody in our family that we're not getting along with or maybe it's historic and we just say that's just how they are. And so we have certain coping methods of how we just kind of dance around them. So here's how we do this differently. And I'm, it's going to require some bravery, but I just want us to be real in this way. You know, Mom, we've had a lot of differences. And you know what? I was wrong a lot of times, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I offended you, and I, I don't want to walk in that offense anymore. And, Mom, I know, you know, you, you, you may have been hurt too by me and other people. I just want to ask you to forgive me. And then I'm just going to forgive you, too, okay, uh, of all those things. And we don't have to talk about everything. I just want you to know that that's how I feel. And, and I, I, I know that God can just set us free. It could be a text. It could be a message on the phone. It could be a, a conversation. But then here's the key to the next part. You're not responsible for their reaction. Amen. Don't go right back into your hole because they rejected you again, okay? They're where they are. Remember, you were where you were when you rejected them a thousand times, okay? We're not, we're playing ping pong, an emotional ping pong, and that's over in Jesus' name. We can't cross over. We can't, we, we're still hanging on to that cookie in there. We've got to let go of all those things. And then, and then release it unto the Lord, okay? Now the joy is going to overwhelm you, and you'll start to recognize it. Somebody snap your finger like this a little bit. You see, you're going to recognize it. Oh, she's living from that hurt spot. And then she's trying to put that on me again, or that man's trying to put that on me again, or that he, he just learned that from his dad, and he hasn't left the he hasn't burned the Asherah poles, and he hasn't torn down the Temple of Baal yet. So we understand that that's where he is. Okay, so I'm not going to be mad at him. So we take the power back right here in Jesus' name, and instead of looking at the elephant all the time, noticing the elephant, smelling the dead gum elephant. Okay, you're going to just put the elephant right up underneath your feet like that. Okay. All right, the elephant doesn't have any power over you anymore in Jesus' name. You're going to love through. When we begin to speak these things into existence, guess what? Somebody else is going to change too. 
They can say, you know what, that's not the old daughter that hurt me before. Because really, you didn't hurt them. The devil hurt them, and by association, you're the victim. They're trying to victimize you. So we're going to leave the victim mentality as well in Jesus' name. In order to cross over, we have to leave the captivity. We have to cross over and conquer in Jesus' name. The next thing I want us to talk about out of Judges chapter 7, verse 2 and 3 is like this. Fear forfeits the fight. Somebody say fear. fear. Forfeits the fight. You don't want to get into the fight at all. Just live in fear. Just go back in your hole, go back in the cave. Many of you have come out of the cave. How many of you have come out of the cave? All around the house, all around the house. Come out of that cave. The rest of you are going to come out if you're not out of it yet. In Jesus' name. Chapter 7, verse 2 and 3. Then the Lord said to Gideon, There are too many people with you. Now the army of Midian had 125,000 people, according to historical record. And Gideon's army had a mere 32,000. I think that's about four times as many people. 32,000 versus 125,000. But God is speaking to Gideon, and he says this. Then the Lord said to Gideon, There are too many people with you for me to hand over Midian to them. Otherwise, Israel will boast about themselves against me, saying, My own power has rescued me. They'll get on Facebook and say that, I'm pretty sure. You wouldn't believe how cool. I sharpened my sword, knocked out 15 of them. Verse 3, so now proclaim in the hearing of the people, whoever is afraid and trembling, let him turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men returned and left 10,000 remaining. So there were 32,000. And they, uh, Gideon goes, okay, I know some of y'all are scared. If you're scared, if you're shaking, I just want you going back home. You can go on back home. 22,000 of them bailed out. Two-thirds of the people bailed out. I think this is an indication of humanity. That most of us live in fear and let fear dominate us. But it doesn't have to be this way anymore. It disqualifies us for the fight. Guess what? It disqualifies us for the victory as well. Now, as I was praying this thing through, I began to realize, you know what? Many of you are not afraid for yourself. You're ready to go for yourself. But then you say, you know what? I have family with me and I can't leave them. If I leave them, guess what? They, somebody might come and attack them or... They may be hurt uh, through the way. So we, we rationalize our failure to fight by coming and now we've gone and we've isolated our family too. And we've just withdrawn into this safe place. But God wants us to be fearless, okay, in Jesus' name. Do we trust God over our family? I believe that we do trust God over our family. See, fear is woven into us as a false identity. We say we're concerned, we're worried, but really we're in bondage. I remember when my mom, after four years of abuse from me as a drug addict and as a rager, every time I talked to her, my mom and dad released me. They said, you're on your own, son. We're turning you over to God. We're not giving you another nickel. Uh, we're going to pray for you, but we're not going to listen to you. When I'd call in the middle of the night raging, they'd give me the dial tone, which is exactly what you need to do right now if you've got people like that in your life instead of giving power to the devil anymore. And when they released me like that, guess what? God started to work in a whole new way. But they withdrew and tried to... Now, now is my dad good for the fight if he's worried about Al all the time? See? The devil wants to send somebody into your life or not the person but the seed into your life and make you isolate and withdraw from the battle. Praise God for my parents' wisdom to say, I see what you're trying to do and I'm not going to allow you to do it in Jesus' name. Do you see the fruit from your ancestors that brought you to this place of coping? Right now, there's some revelation happening in this house about, hey, that's how my mom and dad had to do that, and, and I thought that was good, and that was our people, and, you know, that's, that's how I was raised, and all of those kind of things. But actually, it's just a, a diminishing fear device, a coping mechanism that is not allowing you to walk in complete freedom that God wants you to, in Jesus' name. If fear is disqualifying you from the fight, I don't take that lightly, and there's absolutely no blame involved. But it's time to do something different. See, fear falls directly in the face of faith. We're choosing either fear, which makes us withdraw and do all kind of things as far as the fruit 
of fear. Or, you know what, I say, I, I learned all these verses, trust the Lord with all your heart, and I say them all the time, but boom. My real fruit is I'm running right back to this fear, back to this isolation, back to this cave again. Would you like to let it go today? Some of you are listening to me in your head, but you can't figure your way out of this. I see it. I see, the, I see it turning, but you're not willing to let go of the Oreo in the cookie jar. Because you got, the devil has convinced you that you have to have fear as part of your DNA. It's a false identity. It's a false mechanism. And you don't need it, not for a second. It's a lie. And it disqualifies you from the fight. It disqualifies you from the victory. In Jesus' name, let's go ahead and move forward. For the fourth point I want to make in Judges chapter 4, verse 3 through 7. Judges chapter 7, verses 3 through 7. So now proclaim in the hear hearing of the people, whoever is afraid and trembling, let him turn back and leave Mount Gilead. Let him turn and leave the mountain. So 22,000 went back, 10,000 remained. Verse 4. Then the Lord said to, to Gideon, There's still too many people. Bring them down to the water and I'll test them. Therefore, you'll, there, therefore it shall be that whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, he shall go with you. But everyone whom I say to you, This one shall not go with you, shall not go with you. So, so God is separating the army further. Now they're down to 10,000 versus 125,000, but it's still not enough. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, You shall separate everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, as well as everyone who kneels down to drink. Now the number of those who lapped the water, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300. All the rest kneeled, all the, all the rest kneeled down to drink. And the Lord told Gideon, With 300 men who lapped, I will rescue you, and I'll hand you over to the Midianites. Let all the other people go back to their home. So we're, we're meditating on this, and I've heard a lot of theories about it, but I just asked the Lord, what does this mean for treasure? What does this mean for us? Uh, okay, so, so these guys may have been hiking for, you know, miles and miles with no water, and I'm sure there's a fresh water stream in front of them, and, and Gideon says, okay, if y'all are thirsty, I'll just go on down there and get a drink. And they just, I can just see them just hustling down there, and then almost all of them just laid down like this. I don't know if you can see me, but I just laid down and, and, and just went all the way down into the water, prostrate like that, and, 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 and put their head down in the water to try to get a drink. Well, that's how we do it whenever we're hurting in life. If I put my head directly down in that place, can I see around me? Can I see to, enough to help the guy beside me? Can I get up quick enough to escape myself? I have taken all of my one need that I have for my physical thirst and I have uh, abruptly said the whole rest of my life I put it at risk now and I've risked the other army around me and I can't be part of the revolution that way because now I become very self-interested right but the man who in wisdom is up on a knee and and realize the water isn't going anywhere I need to tell you that right now you understand that the water is there for the drinking okay but but very very calmly can keep his head up and and drink in this fashion can watch out for his brother and his sister beside him he can get up quickly when he needs to he can still get all the nourishment that he needs to so as warriors we need to be thinking about that we're, we're, we're not condemning our our brother beside us but we're helping them we're we're, we're ready to help them and we're, we're ready to say could we do this a different way in Jesus name the lappers lose because they are self-interested, because they're isolated, because they're only concerned about their own needs. How, how, how are you going to get, if both of your hands are on the ground and you're just down there trying to get the water, well, where is your sword? You can't fight. You can't have a sword. You, you have got no ag aggressive, uh, no way of taking any ground, no way of being part of that revolution. If you're on the ground like that, the lappers are going to lose. Next thing I want to talk to you about, and it's the last thing right here. Well, two things. Number one, you go, why is this revolution, what's this about 1%? Because there were 300 men left. 300 is actually a little bit less than 1% of the 32,000 that started. Now, maybe you say to me, well, I'll just be rest of those other guys. I'm sure they're going to make it to heaven too. I, I believe I want my daddy to say, well done, my good and faithful servant, when I get there. I don't want to be as one escaping through the fire. I don't want to be with one to see if Jesus said greater love hath no man that he would lay down his life for his brother right there or his friend 
you know what? I, I'm not laying my life down if I've got my head in the water. I'm going to sacrifice my getting that drink of water just a little bit more time so that I can watch them. There are many things that make us, should motivate us to be part of this 1% in Jesus' name. And I know that you are right here, and I'm proud of you. This is the last thing I want us to talk about, and it's not going to take long. Judges chapter 7, verse 8. So the 300 men took the people's provisions for the journey and their trumpets. Somebody say trumpet. Made of a ram's horn. Uh, Jasper had a shofar out of the shade tree yesterday, I understand. Hope he could blow that dude. That's awesome. So 300 men took the people's provisions for the journey and their trumpets and made ram's horns in their hands. And Gideon sent away all the other men of Israel, each to his own tent. So who got disqualified? The people that were fearful and the people that were self-interested. Is that you? I don't think it is. We're all in for our brother right beside us, okay? And there ain't nothing. When, when, when God's on your side, who can be against you? What are you scared? You're not scared of nothing, are you, Tracy? That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> you guys fire me up. And Gideon sent all the other men of Israel into his, each to his tent, but kept 300 men, and the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. Verse 19 through 21. It'll be the last scripture that we look at. Now, this is such a beautiful thing, especially in light of Ray's testimony right there. Ray didn't say, we went out there and changed the world, did he? He said, God changed me. That's the testimony right there. And he changed him in his brokenness. In his brokenness, he became the light of the world. Let's look at exactly what this says out of Judges chapter 7, verse 19 through 21 as we close. Prayer team, I'd like y'all to go ahead and come. And uh, Sharon, could y'all go ahead and come too, please? So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch when the guards had just been changed with them, and they blew the trumpets. So there were three things that they told them to get. First of all, they had to have their trumpet. Have you got your trumpet? Your trumpet is a de declaration of victory. Your trumpet is your mouthpiece. Your trumpet is your love. Your trumpet is, is the people that, are, that, 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 that you have decided are worth trumpeting to, right? You've got to have, have a hearer if you've got a trumpet, right? So you're going to be trumpeting over those things. And the next thing they had, the Bible says that they had an earthen vessel, which is like a pot. So they had a pot, and somewhere, somehow in this pot, I don't know the, exactly how it worked, but in the pot, there was also a torch. So let's just say that there's a round pot like that, and it had a little space here at the bottom, and then in, inside the pot, there was, a, there was a torch in there. Well, the torch was lit, but the, there was no way of seeing the, the light because the pottery was around it, right? Well, you see, that pottery was made out of earth. And the scripture says that we are the earthen vessel, that we are the potter, that we're the pot, right, in the potter's hands. So that's us. But as long as that vessel is whole and complete, it was holding the light in so that the world couldn't see the light, could it? Let's watch what happens right here. Verse 20. When three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers, they held their torches in the left hand and the trumpets in the right hand to blow, and they shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And each stood in his place around the camp, and the entire Midianite army ran, crying as they fled. So we have a torch. We're holding the torch in our left hand, and, and around the torch is the earth. It is the... It is, it is the, the, the vessel, but really, that's us. And in the other hand is our trumpet. Well, our trumpet, maybe that's the shofar. So as the shofar, as we, as we break the earthen vessel, the torch shines the light. If we're that vessel, we have to come to that place of brokenness in order for our light to shine. Do you understand that? If we're all together, if we got it all together, if our emotions have been holding us on, if we haven't tore down the old Asherah poles and bales of our family and they just said, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and this is what I learned out in the oil field and this is how I am, 
That don't sound broken to me. That sounds like your torch is trapped in there and it's not going anywhere. But if you'll see what Ray wanted, he said on this trip, as I prayed for him and, and asked the Lord to, uh, over this thing and God, God sent him and we're so humble to have him walk with us. And, and, and he said, I want to be broken. I want the earth shattered off of me so that your light will shine all around the world for the rest of the world to see. You see, the broken people break through. That's the last thing I want to say. The broken people break through. But without the brokenness, your light is trapped. Let's pray. Lord, in Jesus' name, you taught us so many things through Jerubbabel today. But I pray that they're not in our head. Lord, that we walk out of fear and into your heart that we tear down the Asherah poles of our forefathers. We don't walk around or tiptoe around the elephant in the room anymore in Jesus' name. That we're not self-interested in sticking our head down in the water all about ourself. And Lord God, that we're willing to become the broken people that have the breakthrough. Lord God, we want our light to shine for you as part of the revolution. But Father God, that revolution has to happen one man, one woman, one child, one teenager, one family at a time to change generations. So, Lord God, I 